There is physical evidence scattered across half the planet that says Earth was struck by something enormous less than a million years ago. The evidence is precise, it is datable, it obeys the laws of physics. And yet the one feature that should make this event obvious, the crater, is nowhere to be found. Across Southeast Asia and Australia, strange black glass has been turning up for centuries. Smooth droplets, twisted dumbbells, flattened discs. In Southern Australia, thin glass buttons shaped as if they were melted in flight and sculpted by fire have been found. Long before scientists understood what they were, these objects were collected, traded, and puzzled over. They looked artificial, purposeful, almost manufactured, but they were neither. This glass is not volcanic and it did not arrive as a meteorite. It is called a tektite. Natural glass formed when a cosmic impact melts Earth's own surface rock and ejects it at extreme speed. The molten material is thrown high into the atmosphere, sometimes beyond it, where it stretches, spins and reshapes before cooling and falling back to the ground. Every curve and contour is a frozen record of violent flight. That detail matters, because tektites don't form casually. They require temperatures hotter than most volcanic systems can reach, forces capable of launching molten rock across continents, and trajectories long enough for the material to be sculpted aerodynamically before solidifying. When tektites appear, they are not ambiguous. They are fingerprints of hypervelocity impact. The glass scattered across this region belongs to the Australasian strewn field, the largest known tektite strewn field on Earth. By area alone, it dwarfs every other confirmed impact debris field. It stretches from southern China, through Indochina, across Indonesia and the Philippines, and all the way to mainland Australia and Tasmania. No other impact in the recent geological past has distributed material so widely, or with such internal order. This was not a local event, it was continental in scale. And yet, if you ask the simplest possible question, where did it hit? The answer is disturbingly uncertain. The timing is not in doubt. Multiple independent dating techniques converge tightly around 788,000 years ago. The age appears consistently in tektites recovered thousands of kilometers apart. It aligns closely with a major reversal of Earth's magnetic field. It appears in sediments across Asia and Australia. This was not a marginal event hiding in noisy data. It is locked into the geological record. The shapes of the tektites themselves tell a story that is embarrassingly clear. Closest to the source are blocky, layered chunks of impact melt known as the Muang Nong type tektites. They show little aerodynamic shaping, meaning they cooled quickly and did not travel far. These are the most primitive forms, material that barely escaped the impact zone before solidifying. Move farther away and the glass changes. Discs and dumbbells appear across Thailand and Vietnam. Their forms stretched and twisted while still molten. Still farther downrange, in Indonesia and the Philippines, Tektites become nearly perfect spheres, frozen mid-flight. And at the far end of the field, in Australia, the glass has been stripped, thinned and sculpted by hypersonic atmospheric heating into classic button shapes with flanged rims and ablated undersides. This progression is not random. It is exactly what physics predicts when molten material is ejected ballistically from a single source in a preferred direction. Distance from the impact controls temperature, flight time and aerodynamic shaping. The Australasian strewn field preserves that sequence better than any other on Earth. The chemistry agrees. Australasian tektites are chemically homogeneous at first glance, but subtly structured on closer inspection. Their compositions match continental crust, not oceanic basalt, not mantle-derived magma, and not meteorites. The variations between samples are systematic, reflecting mixing between specific sedimentary and silicate source rocks, with a small limestone contribution. That signature rules out volcanic eruptions, atmospheric fractionation, and multiple impacts. It points unambiguously to one melt reservoir formed in one event, which makes the missing crater increasingly difficult to explain. Based on the volume of tektites alone, the source crater should be large, tens of kilometers across. An impact capable of melting and ejecting this much material would have fractured the crust, excavated deep into sedimentary layers, and left a structure impossible to miss. We find craters far older, far smaller, and far more degraded than this should be. Yet, no universally accepted crater exists. There are candidates, circular features, gravity anomalies, subtle structural hints, but none command consensus. Each proposed site comes with caveats, counter-arguments, or incompatible ages. For an impact this energetic, the silence is unsettling. One explanation is that the crater exists, but not where we instinctively expect to find it. When this impact occurred, Earth was deep in the middle Pleistocene, a time dominated by powerful glacial-interglacial cycles. Global sea level was significantly lower than today. 
Across Southeast Asia, vast areas of the continental shelf were exposed as dry land. River systems extended hundreds of kilometers beyond modern coastlines and broad, low-lying plains existed where shallow seas now lie. In that context, it is entirely plausible that the impact occurred on land that has since been submerged. A crater formed on the Sunda shelf would now lie beneath shallow seas, buried by marine sediments deposited during later sea level rise. Sea level rise alone does not erase craters, but it can hide them, especially if the structure was already compromised by erosion or infill. This possibility keeps part of today's seafloor firmly in play, not as a convenient escape, but as a realistic reconstruction of the ancient landscape. However, the tektites themselves place limits on how far offshore the impact could have been. Australasian tektites show no chemical signature of deep water interaction. They lack the basaltic imprint extracted from impacts into oceanic crust. Their textures and volatile contents are inconsistent with rapid quenching in large volumes of seawater. Everything about their formation and fly path behavior points toward an impact into continental sediments, not a plunge into deep ocean, which brings the mystery back onto land. Geochemical gradients and the distribution of the most primitive Muangnong type tektites consistently narrow the source region to mainland Southeast Asia, near the modern Thailand Laos Cambodia border. This area sits directly uprange of the strewn field's aerodynamic sequence. It also happens to be geologically complex, structurally active, and cloaked in younger volcanic rocks. Those volcanic rocks may be the key to the crater's disappearance. Large impacts do more than excavate holes, they unload pressure instantaneously. They fracture the lithosphere. They send seismic energy deep into the mantle. In some circumstances, they can trigger decompression melting beneath the impact site, initiating volcanism that post-dates the impact itself. If basalt flooded the crater soon after it formed, the surface expression could have been erased rapidly. Lava infill would smooth topography. Later erosion would remove subtle relief. Tropical weathering would obscure structural clues. Over time, the crater would cease to look like a crater at all. From above, it would appear indistinguishable from surrounding volcanic terrain. This explanation fits the evidence disturbingly well. It explains the missing crater without invoking exotic physics. It aligns with the regional geology. It respects the chemistry of the tektites. And it explains why the only durable record of the event is the material that escaped. Which leads to a deeper implication. The Australasian strewn field is not a mystery because the impact might not have happened. The glass scattered across half the planet makes that impossible to deny. It is a mystery because Earth appears to have absorbed the continent-scale collision and then erased the scar. Less than a million years ago, something struck this planet with enough energy to melt vast volumes of crust and fling that molten Earth across oceans and continents. Early humans were already present in parts of this region. The planet's magnetic field was unstable, climate systems were already under stress, and yet the wound closed. The crater may lie buried beneath basalt, drowned beneath rising seas, or broken apart by tectonics. But the tektites remain, scattered like shrapnel across half the globe, quietly insisting that the event was real. The scar should still be there. The fact that it isn't may be the most unsettling part of the story. I hope you found this as interesting as I did. And as always, thanks for watching. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.